Page 75 Question 11 All our service in every point twice done You rest your hermits This is from Act 1, Scene 6 Page 36 This is spoken by Lady Macbeth to Duncan when he visits Macbeth's castle Duncan is full of gratitude to Macbeth and is in a merry mood in his castle. Duncan apologizes to Lady Macbeth for troubling her and her husband for thus coming to their castle as a guest. Lady Macbeth should hear the trouble he causes her. Sorry. Lady Macbeth should bear the trouble he causes her and her husband. For it is his love which occasion all this trouble to them. Lady Macbeth in reply indulges in fulsome flattery of Duncan. She means to say that her services doubled, even quadrupled, would fall short of the great honours bestowed on her by the king. If the troubles were to be repeated again and again, and then redoubled, they would appear to them as slight and insignificant when they are placed against the honours that Duncan has conferred on them. For the old favours done to them by the king and the new honours, in brackets like the title of the Thane of Corder, bracket closed, bestowed on Macbeth, they will ever remain obliged to pray for the long life of the king. This will be his beadsmen bound to pray. Sorry, they will be his beadsmen bound to pray for his long life. The irony in what Lady Macbeth says here is almost diabolical. She has planned the murder of Duncan, but she declares herself to be his beadsman praying for his long life. The laboured rhythm of the lines she speaks is in contrast with easy flow of lines that Duncan and Banco speak. Their hearts are free and there is peace and beauty there. Lady Macbeth's speech is marked by hypocritical excess. Word Notes In ellipsis double That is twice done that is doubled in every point and then doubled again. Single means weak. Note the opposition between single here and double in line 15. Both single and double are within quotes. Late dignities. Recent honours added to favours obtained in the past. Titles of Dignity in brackets such as Thane of Corder bracket closed Hermits means Beadsmen B-E-A-D-S-M-E-N Medieval kings particularly in Scotland hired Beadsmen to pray for them Hermits are dependent on another's charity and bound to pray for his welfare. 12. If it were done, ellipsis, we would jump the life to come. Act 1, Scene 7, page 37. These are the opening words of Macbeth's famous soliloquy. Here, Macbeth considers the pros and cons of murdering Duncan. Macbeth says that if the act of murder ended with the commission of murder, then it could be done quickly. If the murder ended as soon as it was done, then there would have been objection to it. If the murder could prevent and arrest the consequences of the murder, and as soon as the deed was completed, could achieve success, then murder would be done quickly. If the fatal blow were everything that mattered and nothing more were necessary, then he would take the risk here in this life. In other words, if in this life murder 
bring no evil results, everything is over with the completion of the deed, then one would take a bold step and face the consequences of future life. New Clarendon editor explains the lines thus, quote, If the act of murder could if the act of mother could entangle its own results and obtain at its own conclusion its object, so that this blow might be the one necessary stroke and end the business in this life, just in this life, this little bank of time in the sea of eternity, I would hazard the life to come. Close quotes. Macbeth means to say that we always receive punishment even in this world, in that we teach others to do as we have done and are punished by our own example. In these lines, Macbeth thinks of material consequences of the mother, but his words testify to a tortured conscience. Page 76 He cannot utter the word murder within quotes. He can say within quotes assassination. The length and unfamiliarity of the word hide the horror of its meaning. He says quote it instead of murder. This shows the presence of conscience in Macbeth. Word Notes Trammel up, a T R A T R A M M E L. Trammel up means entangle within its net. Trammel up is used either of hobbling a horse or of enveloping in a net within coats. This is by Harrison. His surcease, S U R C E A S E. Surcease means its completion or Duncan's end. Surcease within quotes means secession, C E S S A T I O N. Be all means all that can happen. End all means no further consequence following. Here, H E R, here means here is emphatic bank and shoal of time means present eternity is a vast ocean compared to which this little limited life is only a little bank a shoal as it were the folio reads school but theobald amends it to shoal s h o a l within quotes this is a happy emendation. Jump the life to come. We would hazard the future life. Number 13. And pity like a new, naked newborn babe ellipsis and falls on the other. Act 1, scene 7, page 40. This is from the soliloquy of Macbeth. Here, Macbeth weighs the pros and cons of murder. He can take the risk of future life by murdering if the act of murder ended with the commission of it. But this is not the case. One receives judgment here in this life. Justice is impartial. By the, the act of murder, we teach others lessons in murder. Moreover, Duncan is his guest kinsman and his wife and his king so it is his duty to protect him from danger duncan has been a good king his goodness will plead loudly for him to the minds of men with the trumpet like tongues of angels against the unforgivable crime of his mother quote pity like a newborn babe riding on the blast or the cherubim of heaven mounted on the invisible winds, will so present the horrible crime to the eyes 
that the flood of tears shall cause the wind to fall. I have no motive to instigate me but an excessive ambition which leaps beyond its mark and falls on the other side. Close quotes, Editor Clarendon Press Professor Clinet Brooks in his book, The Well-Wrought Urn, expresses his opinion that the images are confused. The babe image and the cherubim comparison are not properly expounded. Quote, Does Shakespeare mean for pity or for fear of retribution to be dominant in Macbeth's mind? Helen Gardner in his book The Business of Criticism replies to the criticism of Kleeneth Brooks and gives an illuminating and provocating sorry and provoking interpretation of the passage. Quote, Macbeth having acknowledged the certainty of retribution in his life that, quote, we will have judgment here, unquote, goes on to give the reasons which make the deed which he is meditating peculiarly base. It is the mother of a kinsman and a king who is also a guest who trusts his host to protect him, unquote. The final image of the wind dropping as rain begins is the termination of the whole sequence of ideas and images. The passage ends with tears stilling the blast. The final condemnation of the deed is not that it will meet with punishment, not even that the doer of it will stand condemned, but that even indignation at the mother will be swallowed up in universal pity for the victim. The whole world will know and knowing it will cause, sorry, and knowing it will not curse but weep. The babe, naked and newborn, the most helpless of all things, the cherubim, innocent and beautiful, call out the pity and the love by which Macbeth is judged. It is not the terror of heaven's vengeance which makes him pause, but the terror of moral isolation. He ends by seeing himself alone in a sudden silence where nothing can be heard but weeping. As when a storm has blown itself out, the wind drops and we hear the steady falling of the rain, which sounds as if it would go on forever. Page 77 The naked babe, quote, strides the blast because pity is to Shakespeare the strongest and profoundest of human emotions. It rises above and masters indignation. The cherubim are born with incredible swiftness about the world because the virtues of Duncan are of such heavenly beauty that they command universal love and reverence. Quote, the helplessness of the king who has trusted him, his gentle virtues and patient goodness are transformed in Macbeth's mind into the most helpless of all beings, sorry, into the most helpless of all things. What most demands our protection and then into what awake tenderness, love and reverence. The babe image merges into the cherubim, not because Shakespeare means Macbeth to be feeling both pity and fear of retribution at the same time, but because Shakespeare believes in the holiness of the heart's affections. It is the judgment of the human heart that Macbeth fears here, and the punishment which the speech of the human sorry, which the speech foreshadows is not that he will be cut down by Macduff, but that having muddered his own humility, he will enter into a world of appalling loneliness, of meaning, meaningless activity, unloved himself and unable to love. Unquote. This is indeed a masterly analysis of the passage. The speech testifies to the moral and human scruples that deter him from the deed. Quote, it is with 
his moral nature not with prudential consideration that he is in conflict unquote this is by grierson g r i e r s o n in point of style the second part is in marked contrast to the first part the first part of the speech is jerky and uneven and disjointed it shows the tumult within him the second part marks a change in style it is passionate and sincere and more eloquent word notes a naked newborn babe that is is the very picture of helpless innocence striding the blast riding on the blast heaven's cherubims angels of the particular order mounted on invisible wings couriers that is swift runners or the winds blow is proclaim tears shall drown the wind that is pity will be more powerful than the indignation at the crime spur ellipsis intent that is no incentive to goad me to murder vaulting ambition that is ambition often falls too high and overreaches itself just as a reckless rider may overleap and fall on the other side the imagery is that of an impetuous rider jumping upon a horse number 14 was the hope drunk ellipsis at what it did so freely question mark this is act 1 scene 8 page 41 This is said by Lady Macbeth to Macbeth in indignant remonstration sorry in indignant remonstrance when Macbeth tells her that he will not proceed further in the plan of killing Duncan he has received favorable opinions from all people and he will not court unpopularity by this act Lady Macbeth retorts angrily and tauntingly A drunkard makes pompous boasts of doing this and that but drunkenness is followed by sleep and when he awakes he forgets his boasts and looks pale and sickly after the spell of intoxication so macbeth's hope of murdering duncan was a mere drunkard's fancy lady macbeth mockingly says to macbeth that he has now been roused from his drunken sleep and he looks pale and ill at that which he eloquently promised to perform then he makes an innuendo sorry then she makes an innuendo that his love for her is also short lived and imperfect like his promise it is strong now and it will soon pass away lady macbeth here is the very picture of a resolute and ruthless woman Her will is imperious and her courage invincible. She goads her husband to murder by taunting him, bullying him, reproaching him and coaxing him. Here she sh- she shows her scorn for her vacillating husband. She tries to urge her husband to the deed by rebuking him for his hesitance and taunting him with cowardice. A reproach which quote cannot be borne by any man from a woman with without great impatience unquote this is from johnson page 78 word notes wherein you dressed yourself lady macbeth takes up the matter for a dress which macbeth suggests by the expression cast aside within quotes that meaning is quote when you dressed yourself with the hope of murdering duncan were you in a drunken state question mark unquote hath it slept since that is drunkenness is followed by sleep green and pale sickly and pale like the one who looks so after 
sorry, who looked so after a spell of intoxication, did, planned. Question 15. Nor time nor place ellipsis have done to this. Act 1, Scene 7, page 43. Lady Macbeth is instigating her husband to the deed of murdering Duncan. Macbeth has made a retreat from his decision and has declared his intention not to proceed further in this business. Lady Macbeth is reproaching him, taunting him and bullying him in order to lash him to action. Lady Macbeth says that when he made the decision of murder, then time and place did not hang together. Both time and place were not suitable for the deed. But now, time and place have presented themselves to his hand and he is unprepared. Their conjunction has made him nervous. Then she refers to the sanctity of pledge, the strength of determination. She knows how tender it is to love a suckling child, yet she would forego the tender love of a mother and tear away the child smiling at her face and kill it mercilessly, if that is needed to redeem her pledge. She suggests that it is much less cruel for the host and subject to kill one's king and guest than it is for the mother to kill the smiling infant at her breast. The strained violence of the language is to be noted. Her words are cruel and fiendish, but her womanliness betrays itself. There is a tenderness in her sentiments and language. Word notes Adhere, A-D-H-E-R-E -E. Hang together or agree Made themselves Presented themselves Fitness Conjunction Unmake, make you nervous, boneless, toothless. NB. There is no evidence in the text, in the text that Lady Macbeth has had children. Elsie Knights has an essay on the on the subject. Dover Wilson quotes from Eckermann's E C K E R M A N. A command's conversation with Kete. Quote, whether this is, whether this be true or not, does not appear. Semicolon. But the lady says it, and she must say it. Semicolon. In order to give emphasis to her speech. Full stop. Close quotes. But there is no reason to think that they had no children. Lady Macbeth says this to her husband and there is truth in it. Macbeth is jealous of Panko because his issues will succeed him on the throne of Scotland. 16. Now over the one half world ellipsis moves like a ghost. Act 2, Scene 1, page 5051. This is from Macbeth's soliloquy just prior to the murder of Duncan. Macbeth sees in his fevered brain a dagger floating in the air. He is agitated at the thought of murder. The dagger that he sees is a hallucination, a projection of his heated fancy. He realize, sorry, he realizes that it is the thought of murder that he has in mind which takes the form of a dagger to his eyes. He says that night is the suitable time for the dark deed of murder. At night, nature is asleep over half the world and wicked dreams disturb the sleeper with his curtains. Witches are offering sacrifices to Hecate, their goddess at this time. The murderer who looks ghastly and pale is roused to be his wicked deeds by the howling of the wolf, which is his watch. He proceeds to his dark deed with stealthy footsteps like Tarquin, T-A-R-Q-U-I-N, Tarquin, when he wants to violate Lucrece, L-U-C-R-E-C-E, -E, 
in order to carry out his plan of murder. He moves silently like a ghost. Page 79 The imagery used by Macbeth is ghastly and exaggerated, as if Macbeth was compelling himself to realize, quote, the present horror, unquote. Macbeth is proceeding towards his design, yet even now his heart shrinks from the contemplated murder. He is conscious that his deed is dark and is associated with the goddess of the underworld. He is reminded of Tarquin's stealthy steps for violating the modesty of Lucrece and the noiseless movement of invisible ghost. The associations that come to the mind of Macbeth underline his consciousness of the deep damnation of his taking off. Unquote. Macbeth's moral agitation is clearly manifest in this scene. Quote, the fearless warrior is unmanned by the evocations of the shaken conscience. Unquote. This is from Grierson. Word Notes Nature seems dead. Quote, All action and motion seem to be seized. Unquote. Johnson Because of sleep. Wicked dreams. Ellipsis sleep. Wicked dreams deceive the sleeper in his curtained bed. Curtains sleep. Quote, within quote sleep means sleeper, abstract for the quote, concrete. Milton writes in Comus, C-O-M-U-S, the litter of clothes, curtains sleep. Witchcraft, which is, in brackets, abstract for the concrete. Brackets closed. Hecate, goddess worshipped by the witches. Whose ellipsis watch? The howl of the wolf is like the voice of the watchman. Tarquin's ellipsis strides. With the long swift strides of Tarquin who outraged the modesty of Lucretia, the story of Tarquin, in brackets, Sextus Tarquinius, brackets closed, is told in Shakespeare's Lucre, L-U-C-R-E. He was the ravisher of Lucretia, hence ravishing strides. Hence ravishing strides. Shakespeare remembers his Lucrece, quote, into the chamber wickedly he stalks, unquote. The folios read within quote sides. Pope amends it to stride. Mark the fine transference of epithet in ravishing. 17. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Act 2, Scene 2, page 53. These lines are uttered by Lady Macbeth when Macbeth shouts from the upper stage after the mother. She is afraid that the cry will spoil everything. She does not know that the deed is done. Macbeth is excited to a high pitch. The tension of the deed has told upon his nerves. He cannot keep silent. He fancies, he hears a noise and he shouts. Lady Macbeth is unnerved by the shout. The attempt and not the deed confounds her. She says, within quotes, hark several times, and that shows her nervousness and fright. Her tone here is feeble. She confesses her weakness. She cannot kill Duncan because his face, face resembles her father's. The face of Duncan recalls to her the memory of her father, and she cannot do it. Mark that she cannot utter the word kill within quotes. She also says, within quotes, do. Now the reaction of the strain she made for inciting her husband to murder has began to work. Her ruthless, cruel, hard tone has gone. She seems to be weak, nervous and broken. The woman in her comes out. Her filial feelings, lurking unobserved within her, fierce exterior, assert themselves here. 
The picture of the fiendish woman that we see when Lady Macbeth urges her husband to murder is not a real one. She is essentially a woman with the natural feelings of a mother, a daughter, etc. She only tries to suppress the natural woman in her. But Horace has rightly pointed out, quote, Expel nature, nature will bob out again, unquote. Conscience speaks to her through the senses and the memory as to her husband through the imagination. It is the sight of Duncan looking like her father that stays her husband.